And today we're going to be speaking to the legendary, the iconic Sly Dunbar of the Sly and Robbie firm. Greetings yeah, and thank you so much. Welcome to Earground. Yeah, it's great to be on the show, man. Thank you so much. Well, um, just to begin with, uh, you know, your, your, your history, your uh, resume, resume is so huge. You started music at the age of 15 and 14 years 14 years, 14 years. wow yeah. could you take us through those years what initiative <laughs> <you> had? <laughs> well, um, I, um, when i left school um, around 12 13 12 grade 13 yeah so my mom I didn't want to go back to school so um light park some of the people he, he come around um uh, with his guitar after at least shooter one and I had, I, I had this big tape recorder that a friend of mine had just left by my house. Mm -hmm. So he used to record and I used to mimic like on the tape cover and play like the drum beat. The light box yeah. plays guitar and he would sing new songs and old songs with us. Then we did that for around two years every day before my mother died, you know, and my mother was there watching us, you know, and everything like that. And then now she died. Um, I, I went into a little band called Yard Broom and started playing there. First gig I did was a, a place called Teens and Twenty. And um, I remember the first song I played, I get on a round of applause. Neil version uh, of Red Red Wine, originally done by Neil, Neil Diamond. Yeah. And after that, I remember one day I went to check Lydia and my friend Ranchi. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were playing in a band called Irish in Vinterland. The drummer, a great drummer was, was there, but, but he had left to do something. And Anthony Collins said to me, can you play drums? I said, a little bit. So I said, play, man. I went up playing. I said, like how I playing then. I mean, a couple of weeks after he called me, I said, he wanted me to play on a recording. And the first recording I did was a song called Night Doctor. It came yeah. out as the, uh, as the Upsetters. And, and then by the time I reached going on 15, like I, I played on a double barrel. It was a million selling record for Dave and Anthony Collins. I don't know if you remember that record. What was the name of the record? Double Barrel. Double, double Barrel. Collins. Double Barrel. Yeah. Uh, I think I it was went to number one in England and it went wow. to number 22 in America in 1970. Wow. Wow. I think they're celebrating children records in England. They're celebrating 50 years of it because that was the first number one record. They were wow. 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 Yeah. And Wow, that's quite interesting there. And you performed uh, with the likes of uh, uh, the late legend, Bob Marley, Jimmy Cliff. Yeah, I, 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 I did a, a song for Bob Marley. I did, um, it was um, Punky Reggae Party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I played drums and that, yeah, because wow. I was, I was, Going home one day, so I always stopped by the student on our way home in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So I stopped by Joe Gibbs' student and I saw the engineer. His name is Roddy Thomas. And he said, um, you know, Lee Perry is looking for me. I said, for what? And he said, there's this song that everybody comes and just kind of get the groove. And I said, what am I going to do? I mean, these are some great drummers. He said, they just can't get it right. So... I said to him, what's on the tape? He said, just Bob voice alone. I said, only Bob voice. And he said, yes. Yeah. I said, wow. So I said to him, go into recording right away. Yeah. And it's going to be a one take, no two take. Wow. So it went into red light. I sat around the kit and started playing. And I, I heard Bob saying, and I, and I started click, 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 and feeling for the tempo. And then I made this roll and Bob was still there. I said, no, Bob, you're not going to leave me today. So. I, I, I sat in the jump seat at seven. I said, you have to sit in it, sit in it a, a, a kind of style because um, you can't play too hard, you can't play too soft. And then um, it was seven minutes long. And when I finished, um, the engineer wrote it. I said, I can't believe he did it. So I, said, I told you, one thought. So I fucked my body. So he called, called Lee Perry to say, um, it's done. I said, what do you mean it's done? I said, slide it and it's gone. Lee Perry wow. came over and said, wow. And then he told Bob, and Bob said, okay, I'm going to voice it back now. Like I'll slap it on the drum. And then Paul Douglas put the bass on and the other instrument were added little by little. 
Wow, that is quite interesting there. But did you ever dream becoming that figure would make music for the international community because your music uh, is global? We in Zimbabwe as little kids, this is the music that we're listening to and you still listen to it today. <laughs> But that, that, this is how I used to think, you know, I used to listen to a lot of music because there was a lot of music in the house where I grew up. My mother loved music very much and my sister, so we used to listen to a lot of records, like all those Motown records, the Stax records, Slander Family Stone. Yeah. We used to sit there and we used to listen to records all day. We used to go to a lot of parties. My mother used to send us to a lot of parties, you know, listen to James Brown and all these people and, you know, going always to stay show and these places and everything. So we were really involved in the music you know before i even started playing was was inside of it i could sing remember all these songs and these you know all these shirley and these songs i used to remember all these songs fudge them you know all these things you know so mm -hmm. so when, when i started playing it and like i get in like better and better what i do i, I kind of feel yeah like, this is what i want to do you know so for me the music is my life and it's fun to be around and it is not a day past that i don't think of music or trying to make something in music. Wow. And do you remember how many records you have made up to date? <laughs> well, I, I think I have played over a million records. Wow. wow. Because um, Anthony Collins, who put me on my first record, he said to me that I am the most recorded drummer. And I think I've played on um, over um a million records and it's probably wow. even more wow that is that is quite a lot i mean a, mil, a million records uh and you still continue to make music yeah, yeah i'm still making i'm still recording like kind of like um the other day i was in the show i played two songs for somebody and i um mm -hmm. i still make record and this week coming up to play a couple of songs for some people because like even if i'm playing live i'm programming i don't know why they trust me to give them the, <laughs> the right beat you know but you know sometimes i go to the studio and the drum machine just making just beats and just giving them the beats and then they go to somewhere else and just double on the other musician on it and once they get the beat they say they're all right <laughs> okay wow yeah. Wow, great. Uh, I'm going to take just a small break and then we're coming back uh, okay. in a second. Yeah, stay tuned. Welcome back to Year Ground, the number one show around on the internet right now, hosted by Plot and, well, co-hosted by me, Don Dada. Now we're joined by the amazing Sly Dunbar, and we're getting to know a little bit about his music and his career, the man behind the music, and there's just so much to talk about. Before we cut off, we were having a conversation about how you are one of the most um, recorded drummers around Indian track that is so amazing now I'm looking at at a write-up that was done in 1979 by Brian Eno and he says when you buy a, a reggae record there's a 90% chance the drummer is Sly Dunbar you get the impression that Sly Dunbar is chained to a studio seat somewhere in Jamaica now for me <laughs> that's <laughs> that speaks about work ethic like uh, amazing work ethic how much does that does that play a role in your life and, and in your career having a strong work well, ethic well um that, that plays a big part of my life because i enjoy doing it and i used to go to the studio like from 10 o'clock in the morning and i would be there like until two o'clock in the morning and sometimes I'd go to like 30 songs a day yeah. and this is like every day you know unless i don't want to do it on that day but i enjoy it so much because every day is a different song and different beats and different patterns, you know? So for yeah. me, it does make me feel comfortable doing this. I feel at home just playing. That's so beautiful. And, and music does make you feel re relaxed and at home. Now, I heard yeah. earlier you were 
talking about getting your start in Studio One. And I was I was speaking to Mama Marcia Griffiths, and she spoke about Studio One as well. And I, I want to know about the importance that, that Studio One played in the development of, of the reggae industry in Jamaica and then the world, because it seems that um, all of the older generation, they, they have been connected to Studio One in one way or another. But for me, I didn't play a Studio One in the early days when I was coming up. I was playing a studio like Randy's downtown and Dynamic Sound Studio and Federal Studio. Because Federal Studio was where I did my first record that was called Night Doctor. But for me, Studio One is, is, my, is the universe for me. I, I, I listen to Studio One and I learn a lot from the Studio One as being a producer, musician and everything like that. So for most musicians in Jamaica, young musicians like in my age, Studio One was the, the label they used to listen to, you know? They yeah. used to make like the, the best set of music in Jamaica, Studio One. Yes, yes, I've, I've heard them say that Studio One was, was the Motown of Jamaica, that they, they were like yeah. Marvin yeah. Gaye yeah. and the biggest of yeah. the big, that was amazing. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the different artists that you've worked with as well. Now, I mean, there, there's the, the obvious when you look at the reggae artists, and I mean, Black Uhuru, Chaka Demison, Plyus, uh, Beanie Man, and Red Dragon, these are all amazing names. And then you start getting names such as Grace Jones and the Rolling Stones, and, and this <laughs> now speaks to so much adaptability. I mean, <laughs> how, did, how did that come around, and, and, and how was it adapting to those situations? Well, uh, like playing for like Rolling Stone, like um, we used to play in, um, in dance bands, you know, going around in Jamaica, yeah. playing in clubs and all these things. So we had to play like tune from the top top four of the charts. But in Jamaica, we, we used to listen to like all these Beatles and Rolling Stone records. Because one of the first drum patterns I tried to play on a drum was, I can't get no satisfaction. There's a break in it. I try, and I try, I can't. That kind of beat, you know, I tried to play it on a... Somebody shouted to me and said, go and try some fishing. No, you're not doing that. I said, okay. <laughs> so, but um, getting around to that now, um, um, we listen to a lot of music. And um, for me, like getting onto the start of thing, we were doing so many records, so much, many recording in Jamaica. And like Peter Touch was, was signed to, when I was playing with Peter Touch, he was signed to Rolling Stones Records. So oh. there, um, Charlie and I became good friends, Mick and Keith. Ronald and all these people. But um, and then we were doing so much recording, recording like for outside people like um, Joe Cocker, um, Grace Jones, uh, um, Gwen Gushy. I think it's one of these records and, and artists in Japanese and everything, in Japan and these things. I think probably like people like Bob Dylan would probably heard one of these records and then they send and call us and say, you want uh, Rob, Rob and myself to play on the record. So, we went there and then um, Mick has uh, access to play on the solo album. <laughs> I had to play like a, a couple of tune on one of the Stones album. Like I opened up like two snares on one of the Stones album also. And then Joe Cocker, Nona Hendrix, Simple Red, um, 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 something I can't remember. Um, uh, Money the Bango, Ian Drury, Serge Gainsbourg. Um, Man, fella. Um, wow. uh, so so many. Sometimes I, I leave out. Uh, no doubt. Uh, 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 well, man. Sometimes so many. You know, you <laughs> can't remember some of the names. But I played a couple of records with Herbie Hancock. Um, yeah. uh, and I played. Um, um, Nona Hendrix, um, uh, the song Girl I Want to Have Fun, uh, Sing the Love Bar. Um, a good portion of a lot of the people, you know, and then local. I played on probably everybody records in Jamaica. Yeah, now, it seems that, that um, you, you played a big part as well in, in the, the reggae dove revolution that happened in, in Europe. Um, and we speak about with Lee Scratch Perry and um, the Upsetters and, and um, even with the punky reggae song that you made with Bob Marley, that was uh, very unusual 
for its time. What was that like? Um, um, bringing introducing a new sound into into Europe and and so on. Well, uh, this funky reggae thing was happening in Europe, and, and Lee Scratchfire wrote the song. So, you know, I've heard different version of it that other drummers that play, but I think he, he wasn't satisfied with it. And um, when I heard it, I said, "Well, I, I just hear it one way. I'm going to play like straight four with the snare and the, the third beat." And that's what I did. Cause I was just listen to what Bob was singing and trying to fit in that groove, you know. Yeah. And I, 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 what I did, I just be myself and just do what I have to do, you know. Yeah, and we're so thankful for that because who you are has changed reggae music forever. So please don't change. <laughs> well, you see, what I mean is that people kind of give me the inspiration all the time. Yeah. To play. So, um, you know, whenever somebody say to me, like, I was probably sitting in the parking lot and someone would come and say, oh, you look like Slime, which one are you? And I said, Slime, I say, I love your music. And it might be an LL person. I said, what? Little piece, these people listen to my music. I can't believe it. So <laughs> it makes you want to go, go more. And then you want to reach out to the young. and want to reach out to the LL people, you know. So we're targeting everybody to just make everybody happy by just listening to the music, you know. Very true, very true. And um, well, last question that I have for you before I know Plot wants to get into a break. So uh, just a quick question. Your favorite studio session that you remember? Um, could you tell us a little bit about it? <laughs> all, all, all studio sessions are favorite to me because <laughs> you have to make the song sound good so the people can enjoy it when it comes. So you have to put everything, everything you have into it. I remember um, one of, I think I remember was when we were doing um, Just Another Night for Mick Jagger. And we were running it down like, I mean, a couple of times as well, maybe about 20 times we were trying going for it. And no, no, no. And then I said, I'm going to do something. And at the, at the three minutes, I look, click at my watch, look at my watch, and I say, okay, it's going to tag out. So I switch the beat and go like for a mix, like boom, 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 boom. Pop, 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 and and then I, I, I make that film. And Robbie didn't even know I'm gonna make that change and make the film. I came back in and catch what the song, the, the original beat I was playing, and thought, take it home now. Cause I said, well, we are, we are the tape line now, so we can let us enjoy the tune. And the producer was Bill Laswell, who was working with us on a lot of projects. He produced a couple of albums for us. And, and when I look behind me, cause my back was turned to the control, when I look behind me. I said, Bill, I like this in there. I said, yeah, that's it. So, so wow, man. Because we're running that song down for quite a while, you know. And we got it in that, uh, in a, when I changed and started playing, do, do, that kind of dance all mix. Because the tune was like 118 or, or something, 120 beats. And then I started playing, do, 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 do. That, that mix, that kind of slow mix in it. And so, yeah, that's it. Great, great. Um, you know, talking about dancehall, uh, I was dying and itching to talk about dancehall. Um, you, you were also um, involved in the creation of a number of readings, um, but you still remain rooted in reggae music. Uh, what's your take on the current state of dancehall? Well, um, the, the current state of dancehall um, is, is, is okay for what the kids I'm going to call it, listen a lot of the trap music, but um, it, it don't have to go. Trap music is trap music, RB is RB, rock and roll is rock and roll, and dance all is dance all. But you know, they, they have all these computer and, and, and things, so everybody wants to experiment and come up with different beats. But for me, a lot of people like the, the old school kind of dance all, which we can take the old school and make it modern because what I do, I, I I put different sound to because my dance hall for me is just taking looking at Africa, which for me my music comes from Africa. Taking all these beats from Africa, percussion and all these things, I put it into dance hall and when the percussion is in, you don't need a lot of instrumentation. You don't need nothing like the trap or anything going because the percussion is gonna dance the song. Mm -hmm. If you listen to Be the Man song like um, Foundation, you can hear it in it. Dun, 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 dun. All this percussion inside of it and it make you want to dance and even Mission Impossible version here at Bongo playing. So coming from uh, 
I'm music and playing in bands and playing with other people and percussionists. I know all these things. I like percussion very much and you know putting this in the record, but some of the people who are programming, you know, the dance all they're they're musicians but they're not drummers. So mm -hmm. they're not feeling what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. So I approach it from an African kind of thing or the Brazilian kind of anything with percussion drums. I mean, I would say Africa because there's everything is Africa. All rhythm is Africa. From Africa point of view, and then I, I, I learned from Africa like just drums playing and people singing and dancing. I say, see, we don't need other yeah. instrumentation but drums. When I'm programming the drums sometimes, yeah. I'm just doing the drums by myself because a lot of the producer just want me to play the drums by myself. They don't even want other instruments to be their car. They say, Sly made the drum just do everything, dance by itself, you know? <laughs> so, 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 um, but I like playing with other musicians still because, you know, you get ideas and things like that. So, I would put up the drums. Sometimes I put up like 16, 20 track of drums, percussions, and these things playing and balance it, you know? I think, wow. but I think, I think for me, that is the kind of dance all that I think people kind of enjoy because, you know, you're using congos, you're using bongos sometimes. I hear things playing inside of it, but with the trap, yeah. sometimes it's like it's every other trap sound alike, you know? It's like you can't tell the difference sometimes, you know? But it's good music too, but everyone sound alike and it's, everything's the same tempo. Mm -hmm. You know? But and it's, okay, about... you know, it's good, it's all good, you know? Mm -hmm. Great. Talking about Africa, uh, uh, did you ever perform in Zimbabwe? I try to remember if I played the country once once we were on a sun a sunsplash tour. Mm -hmm. I came out, I don't mm -hmm. remember we went to Zimbabwe. I don't remember. No, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But no, I I, I performed in uh, Nigeria in Benin. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I performed in Senegal. Because yeah. I used to play with Jimmy Cliff also, you know, um, in nineteen seventy five. I did oh, wow. Jimmy Cliff. Senegal and Jimmy Cliff, yeah. And I think those are the places I remember that I played in. And um, I think I played in, um, I did a, a festival um, in Morocco, because Morocco is Africa. Yes. Yeah. Morocco is Africa. So I played, I did a, I think it was with um, Ali, Ali, um, Ali from UB40. I think. Yes. Um, Ali Campbell. I think, I think, I think being, I, I'm trying to remember, Bitty McLean was on it. I don't remember, but in, in Morocco we did a, I played at this festival in Morocco, yeah. Oh, and the one drop, um, is it correct to say the one drop, this is where all the reggae and the dance all comes from, the one drop? Yeah, yeah well, um, I think the dance all really came from Kumina, a mentor, the older beat that was in Jamaica when I was growing up, and then <laughs> out of the mentor came the skia, which is, Ding, 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 and rock said to be slow. Dun, dun, dun. But it's still a of downbeat, the second beat, the drop, and then and then that's one drop because both this kick and the snare is playing together. And then you have reggae come down, and reggae play. And the dance will come down. So the dance style is more and more like um, kind of kumina, kind of mental, kind of more Africanish with the rhythms. Because when you listen to the Af with African rhythm, you can hear the kind of movements in the dance or on, on the Brazilian stuff, on the Latin stuff. You can hear it fitting into it, you know. It can also fit yeah. into the reggae still, you know, but you hear more working with the, the dance style. And the dance style sometimes can go alongside the rap and work because the dance all it can be powerful you know real powerful really real powerful like it's, it's a powerhouse music like the dance all come like a powerful rock and roll i want to tell the dance are probably the most powerful music right now i mean when you line it up and so i mean doom, doom, doom. Yeah. that that's it to kick off the door man it's really powerful if yeah. you get it really yeah. really really strong wow thank you so much i would love to do another Interviews, unfortunately, that you yeah, no, any, any, anytime, time. anytime, you know, just, just let us know because we have to share what we know. And I didn't Great. know that Dan Dada was, an, was a DJ, you know. <laughs> I was at the, the studio, and we yeah. bring up, he said, you know, you know, I said, no, I didn't bring it up, bring it up on the 
the monitor. So, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, but enough respect, man. Thank, you, you, thank you. Thank you. Know? Thank you so much. Respect. Enough respect. <laughs> I'm gonna I said, wow, I said, I can't believe it. I wrote say, yeah, man, the DJ said, yeah, wicked, wicked. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Oh, man, you made my day. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You, sir. <laughs> so I'm gonna play days, a song from Don't Dada. Um, we have to make some rhythm for you, man, and send it. You could voice and send it back to us, you know? I, I would you love that so much. Well, we, you can send your email address or something. We could make some things, and uh, you can say it's music, and we can't predict what's gonna happen, but. I like uh, working with the culture and the culture, you know, different culture. And, yeah, man, because it's anything. It's just music and we just want people to enjoy themselves, you know? Yes, sir. Yes. sir thank you so much. Thank I will definitely go up on that. Thank you so much. This yeah, is man, the best day ever. Man. I, I really love that, you know? So you could open up Africa some more to and all people around it to, 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 to yeah. the dance yeah. hall. And I don't say coming straight from Jamaica, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what we got to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome, man. I'm going to play a song from Don Dada. Yeah. Play a song yeah. and then we end the conversation. You're welcome. Thank you so much to everybody right. who's been watching. We're definitely going to have a very long one uh, with the elder uh, slide down. But thank you so much for the time. Yeah, man. You're welcome. All right. Sly and Robbie. Reggae powerhouse band. Don Dada. Right side. In the city, here the lie and rob. From the jungle you can hear my call On the battle ground, the giants fall Do you remember the lions fall? Say the wings,